It's been in the headlines and all over the airwaves for months. Time now for the Fisherman's Broadcast. Jim Wellman's here. What do we have, Jim? Uh, today from Bonavista, we heard from a fisherman who cleared the grand total of 10 cents last week. You heard it right. He got a check for 10 cents. That's all that was left over after he straightened up with the plant for an advance on his fuel. But this is probably an exception. Well, I suppose so, obviously, but there's, there's a very real crisis in the inshore fishery. Now this young fellow would be a great hand hauling a cod trap. Look at those shoulders. But fitness instructor Paul Clark works in a gym instead of the family fishing boat. He says the fishery is gone. Well, it looks, looks like all the big draggers are out there taking all the fish, and when the inshore fishery goes out to get your fish, they're not getting no fish, because all the big draggers are taking all the fish away. And then when they do get cut, he gets off with it. He gets little, little penalties. So what's happening to the inshore fishery as a result? It's uh, dying off, and all the other fishermen are, ain't getting no work or no fish. No work, no fish. Paul Clark is right. The fishery is dying. It's just about dead on its feet along the entire northeast coast. And most fishermen feel if something isn't done soon, something other than handouts and make work, a whole way of life could die with it. Despite all the talk about the fishery, we still don't know a whole lot about it. The fish have a mind of their own. You can never predict where or even when they'll strike. Federal scientists are paid to keep on top of the fishery. They're supposed to know what's going on. Last year, when the fishery failed so miserably, the insurmen blamed it on offshore overfishing. But the scientists said no. Cold water temperatures were keeping the fish outside. Temperatures in the cold cord Labrador current off the east coast, say from 100 meters down to 300 meters, were generally lower than they've been in the last 20 years. But this year, water temperatures were ideal. Now the scientists tell us they simply don't know, don't have a clue why the fish have not come to shore. The fishermen don't believe that for a minute. They think the scientists know a lot more about overfishing than they're letting on, that their political bosses won't allow them to come clean with the public. Tom Best of Petty Harbor is typical of many fishermen. It's our suspicions that uh, they happen to uh, believe strongly in uh, what the fishermen are saying, that their evidence points to the same, uh, same problem areas and that, uh, that we've got a major problem in the offshore right now as it relates to the, uh, probably the big companies and the uh, offshore draggers depleting the stocks. Uh, we firmly believe uh, that the uh, federal research scientists, the scientists if you want to call them, uh, believe the same things, but because of their employment, uh, the people they work for, and their, the political persuasion that's there, that they're not at liberty to say what they, what they really believe. In other words, their political bosses won't allow them to, t uh, to tell all. Oh, that's what we happen to believe. I mean, if you look at the uh, federal government the restructuring program, the Kirby Report, the uh, provincial involvement, you have uh, big investments there from both on a federal level and a provincial level. And these are the people that uh, that uh, that handle the paychecks, and uh, the federal research people are the people that depend on them for their livelihood. So uh, uh, they may want to say more than they can really say. We don't know if Tom Best is right or not, but we do know the deep sea draggers are cleaning up on the northern cod stocks, an area that stretches all the way from Hopedale to Cape St. Mary's. We also know that instead of spreading their draggers over the whole of the northern cod, the big companies have taken more than 90% of their quotas on the Funk Island banks. Here's something else we know, and this is important. Inshore fishermen in Labrador, the area left alone by the draggers, are having a big year, their best in a long time. On the other hand, inshore fishermen who depend on migrating cod from the funks are having their worst. And then there's the nasty business of dumping all those small fish thrown back to the gulls after the draggers pull their nets. We know it's going on, we hear there's a lot, but we really don't know how much. That's all public information. It's widely known. What isn't so widely known is how badly fishermen are hurting. Many have had to turn in their boats to the loan board. Some, the younger guys in particular, can't keep up their mortgage payments. They're in danger of losing their homes. And you know, in many Newfoundland communities, when the fishermen are hurting, everyone feels the pain. Here in Bonavista, a town that lives or dies by the inshore fishery, there's no real poverty. Nobody's going hungry or anything like that. But nobody's got any money either, and the whole place is hurting. 
Merchants love to hear cash registers ringing, but they're not ringing nearly enough these days at Riff's department store, one of the largest in town. The manager there is Elwood Fisher. The economy right now, it's bleak. People are coming in and they just says they haven't got the money to spend. Like, they just want, they're only gonna buy the things that they really need right now. I've got uh, my father fishes, my uncle fishes, and some days they go to get nothing. So I guess you know about all this firsthand. Yes, like I, I had one of my uncles went out there not too long ago, $20. You know, that always doesn't even pay for days, days work. A good break on the pool table is all right, but August Meitzen could use a real break for a change. Meitzen calls his hotel the Oh Happy Site, but he wishes at times he'd never set eyes on it. August, but business not much these days? No, business lousy. Ah, nice shot. Ah. Ah, nice. Ah. No, normally I'd be behind the bar serving the boys, but uh, things are very slack, so I have a had a game of pool with the odd person that might come in. Why is it so slack? Well, apparently the fish is scarce, and this is a fishing community. Everybody depends on the fishing industry in this area. So when the fish is scarce, that means money's scarce. Nobody can afford to go out and spend their money at the clubs. They'll go to the liquor store, get it cheaper, or from the distributors. And they have to buy food, that's for sure, and clothing. Not much left. That big rock over there is Gull Island, and just beyond that is Cape Bonavista. The Cape is generally accepted as the spot where John Cabot made landfall in the New World. The Butler family, Arch and his three boys, pass by here every day on their way to the fishing grounds. But you'd hardly believe it's the same bay John Cabot made so famous. When Cabot happened along nearly 500 years ago, these waters were full of fish, far cry from today. You know, when John Cabot came here, they said that he uh, he could have walked ashore on the face. I like trying to call him out. He won't get enough to make a bit of fish and roast. A slight exaggeration, but only slight. The butlers and most other fishermen along the Bonavista Peninsula are barely managing to stay afloat. Have you got a bit of fish here this morning, boy? Small bit, right off a of small, huh? It is, isn't it? Yes, sir. Need a big one here this morning. Uh, that's the way it's been all summer? That's the way it's been all summer. I haven't seen no live fish in the summer. And is this an average day for you now, or a good day, or what? About average, I suppose. Nothing there, is there, boy? Nothing Four there. Four fellas? Nope, nothing at all. Nope. Now, that's what you call a fish, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, that's crab, isn't it? Now, that's what you call a fish. Fish. Biggest one day, look. Okay. All the backwards, raise up. Now, what have you been averaging a week? About $80, $100 dollars a man. It's only expensive to come out to do all your bait. About $80, $200 a man. Yeah, that's good for some of the girls around here, eh? Well, that's, that's excellent, yeah. You got people around here only getting $14 or $15 a week. Because they're poor fishing. The kids went to school the year, you know, all the, the parents couldn't buy enough clothes for them. And you got people paying mortgages on their houses, they can't afford to pay it, and on their cards, and you know, the, the, the hard situation we're in here buying Bonavista right now. It seems like nobody listens to us. Because, no, you know, it seems like they don't care. Arch Butler cares. He's been on the water for 59 summers and he's had his two older boys out since they were teenagers. Reg there was even younger, too young really, but Arch had just lost his wife. He had no choice. Oh yes, Reg. I had a car you fishing when he was eight years old, because his mother paid us down, and I had taken water out of town, and just really got, it, got into fishing. So in other words, you wouldn't be, have anybody at the mine at home, so you'd have That's to bring right. them out with you? No, I had to bring them out to see for the mine, didn't I? Been on the water ever since? Yeah. Reg, do you plan to spend the rest of your life on the water? I don't, I don't know. Why, uh, I suppose got, if it improves, I will. you see uh, any hope for it at this point? No, I don't know. Why they, get, they do anything about the offshore trawlers or something, it might be all right. Not doing much with it this summer. No. 
this, this is the worst. This is the worst because the only thing, only thing we fish we get now is what comes to the dragon's nets. What they lose, we get. We get. That's, that's what you figure. Yeah, that's what I figure. Ben, what about yourself now? You've been at it a long time as well. Yeah. It's okay if there's any fish, but there's no fish now. Well, nothing this summer, right? Nothing, no. Last, no, last three summers, there's no, there's no fish. Well, how long can you hang on in a, in a fishing boat if there's no fish? <laughs> no, this is the last one. Is that right? I dare say. What are you trying to do? We have to pack up. Pack up and take off somewhere. You've already heard the butlers mention the draggers, but Headley says he knows just the guy to give us a first-hand account of what they're up to. Yeah, I got the fellas here from Land and Sea. They want to know what time you're going to be in, and uh, they want you to talk about the trawlers and that. Over. Yeah, 10-4, 10-4, I don't know. What time will you be in, Headley? What time will you be in, over? Yeah, we're leaving now in a few minutes uh, here, Pierce. Probably half hours time, three quarters an hour. Over. Yeah, I should be in about 1.30. I should be in about 1.30, I think, buddy. I should be in about 1.30, I guess, buddy. Over. Yeah, 10 for them, buddy. Over in Clare for now. Uh, Headley, this guy's, uh, you say he's a good fellow to talk about the trawlers. Why is that? He was on the draggers. And he knows what the situation is. He even went on, I suppose, his two or three years. And now he's gone to small boats. He told me he knows what fish they were to throw away. So I think he's, uh, and he's not afraid to, to speak up about it, so he's a great man to uh, have, you know. It's hard to get men to speak up, isn't it? That's right, it is. Because you've got fellas that won't speak up because they don't want to, to tell their identity because he might have to go back on the draggers. True to his word, Headley's buddy was waiting when the butlers landed at the wharf. Uh, Pierce Drury, this is uh, Bill Kelly from Land and Sea. Hi, Pierce. He knows all uh, about the dragons and the, and the Misty's causing up there, so he can explain it to you. Oh, this is the man you're talking about yes, on the, uh, the, the radio. radio. Can you confirm what most of these guys think here, that uh, that trawlers are to blame for the lack of fish in shore? Well, that's the, the biggest problem that we got right now is the trawlers, because there's a lot of a lot of dumping going, and sometimes they make a toll, and you get 70, 80,000, maybe 90,000 in uh, caught in, and you can't get it in. In order to get it in, you have to cut off the bag and let the fish float away. Mr. Burry, you say that uh, tens of thousands of pounds of codfish are being just being thrown overboard. Have you seen that yourself? I've seen it hundreds of times. This is going on all the time you're out there? All the time, all the way I was out there. Over in Little Catalina, another ex trawlerman Mercer Cullimore, tells much the same story. The has got a lot of cut off. How do you know that, though? And what you haven't got cut off, you got killed and everything else done with it. Well, I was on a dragon for quite a while. Yeah. So I tell you a good story about it. Well, go ahead. What, what do they do? I've seen uh, 35, 40,000 come up the ramp. We get about five, 6,000 going to all. Rest lag on either side of it. Well, why would they do that? Because it's too small. It's too small to bring in. So the fish is too small to just simply throw it out? Sure. That never goes to the bottom no more. Gobble up by the gulls, I suppose? <clears throat> well, I suppose. They don't go down no more anyway, that's for sure. And now they're fishing off here on the point there, about seven, eight hours steam for a dragger. He was there loading go all last winter. Three and four hundred thousand fish back in four and five days, five and six days. So how can a fish come in there? When the cape was ready to come, there's no fish to come because the fish are cut up. We got to stay just because them fellas got once a live. So you figure uh, perhaps that, that uh, it was just as well to have them on unemployment for a couple of winters rather than have, uh, have you guys out of business altogether? Sure you know as it is. It makes common sense. What do the plant workers think of that, your own relatives and friends who work there? Well, no, that's something I can't say either, you know, because if he wants a day's work so well as next man, right? Mm -hmm. So it's going to be a pretty big racket around oh, here over yes, that. it's going to be a racket. There's got to be a racket before she straightened out. Another place, another fisherman, but the same sad story. Morning, Eric. Morning. How'd you make out? 
Well, I had the usual catch, box full, about 100 pounds, I expect. Hardly worth your while going out, is it? Not worth going out for, but I know. Only you feel that you've got to get up and go out because of what you're used to doing. Eric Nurse of Champneys East gets so little fish these days, he salts the works. It takes a bit more time and a bit more trouble. But he'll get a few extra dollars, and in these tough times, every dollar counts. Nurse says he's seen bad years before, but it's never been so bad for so long. Well, it's been bad enough that there are times when I would have bought a fish if I could have found one to buy, eh? And you couldn't even find one to buy. Listen, do you hold with the general opinion that the trawler is responsible for this? Well, every man, woman, and child in Newfoundland almost know what, what's gone wrong with the fishery. I was I stood here about 10 years ago, and this was the old fellows. They're up in the graveyard now, and they said that the day would come when you wouldn't get a fish to eat. And this summer, I fancy I could hear those guys saying that all over again, you know? The fish is gone, and it's going to take something to bring it back. And you figure it's the draggers, don't it? I'm sure it's the draggers. How do you know that, Eric? Uh... Well, you can talk to any draggerman, and he'll tell you. Even the dragger guys are getting on easy themselves, eh? They they talk about all the fish that's been thrown away. Look, here's a small fish. All the undersized fish they're getting. They some guys say it's as much as 40 percent that's being thrown, shoveled off the deck out there, and the gull is just eating it up. Hard to believe, isn't it? Our own draggers dumping tons of fish offshore. But we've heard those kinds of horror stories all along the Bonavista Peninsula, and we've heard them from the draggermen themselves, the guys who work on those boats. For obvious reasons, they're not prepared to speak on camera, but they are worried, just like the insuremen. Well, she, she got a course and they've actually got a great interest. She's probably been for three weeks, so if there's any first round, she can make it all kinds of stuff. Yeah, she's been trying to sell it a year, got her hands down here. Gary Monks of Kings Cove knows many trawlermen personally, and he doesn't doubt their sincerity for a moment. But that's precious little consolation to a man who earned only $30 last week. All this is pretty discouraging for a man who left the life in the city to go back to his roots. I was born in King's Cove and I lived here for 13 years. Took my grade eight here in education and I went to St. John's. Parents moved in and her father moved in to work. And I, uh, didn't like it in there, hated every minute of it. <laughs> so uh, I finished school in there in grade 11 on a, a Thursday, and on a Sunday morning, I moved back here to live, and I'm here ever since. When I went fishing first, well, I fished a hand line. And that summer, we landed 100,000 pounds off my body with a hand line, with a little speedboat, a 17-foot open boat. We landed 100,000 pounds on a hand line. And now, you won't live long enough to bring 100,000 pounds on a hand line out here. Well, how much have you taken under the summer, for example? Well, we've fished cod traps since the 26th of April. We've had it over almost continuous. We might have had it up for a week cleaning it. And we've got 37,000 pound that's a cod trap, and we're hand lining since the first, second week in August. We've been hand lining ever since, and trying and everything else. We had to try and everything. And we've got 37,000 pound. And the fish you're getting now is not fish. At them years, you go out and you get, uh, you come in with 1,000 pound of fish, you'd have five, 600 pounds, that'd be over 24 inches. It wasn't 23, then it was 24 for large. And now, you go out now and you come in, you've got a job to get in over 16. Well, Gary, you got three kids up to yourself. Uh, do you intend to put them into the fishing boat or encourage no. them to do it? No. Why? Under no circumstances, because there was no future in it. Not at the present rate now, but maybe by the time, with us fellas fighting the way we are to try to get something changes, maybe by the time that they do grow up, there will be changes. But the way it is right now, I, I don't know what I do if he ever goes aboard the boat. That's one of Gary's sons riding home from school. Now, if you think Gary is adamant about keeping them out of the fishing boat, you should hear his wife, Eveline. She's so discouraged, she even wants her husband to pack up the family and leave the fishery altogether. I sent her from the goal and get a trade for myself. Are you actively encouraging him to get out? Yes, but the answer is no. No from him? Yes. So you got a bit of a little problem there, have you? Yes. It's like trying to move King's Cove. <laughs> They're going to continue to work at it? Yes, because there's, you know, there's nothing here, and, you know, to make a living with now. Fishery's getting worse. But do you really believe now, let's say, in your early 30s, that, that you can really go out and start over somewhere? Yes, I think you could. Where? Well, Gary, well, he got his grade 11, and he can get in school now. 
if we wanted to. But are you talking about going to St. John's or going to Toronto? Oh, yes, or? go to St. John's. Renting would be a problem, I guess, you know. Be high rent and things like that, but... So, Evelyn, you'd actually be willing to, to pack up your family and move away from here? Yes, I would. And you think you'd be better off? I leave much behind when I, you know, if I leave anyway, right? We haven't got a new home. We only got an old home. But we're supposed to start a new home, but if there's not a living here, I don't see much point starting one. The man unloading his fish here is Albert Johnson. He did all right today, but he had to go off 50 miles. His boat, the one there tied up to the wharf, is too small by rights for that long a trip, but Albert says you do what you have to. Johnson is a man other fishermen look up to. He heads up an organization with members from 70 communities. It was Johnson's group, a forerunner of the new Inshore Fisheries Association, that first raised the issue of overfishing. When we spoke to Johnson last month, the Federal Minister of Fisheries was coming, and at long last, he expected results. We've been at it now since uh, we formed that committee in uh, February, I believe. And uh, we had meetings with them uh, in the spring, and we told them the very same thing. Uh, we complained about what, what, what's been happening in the fishery, and now it just seems like uh, they're starting to do something about it. And we like to think that we we play a small part in what's happening right now, our committee. Well, isn't it a shame, though, that if you fellows have been saying this, and I know you have for six or seven months, that it's only now they're coming around to... Well, of course, uh, that's, that's the government for you. It takes a long time to get them to get things going. And hopefully now they're going to make things better. So. Tom Sidden came and went, but Johnson didn't get the action he wanted. When we talked to him again last week, he was an angry man. We were really disappointed. We thought that he was going to have some more concrete news or something and tell us we were... What, what, what they actually did was uh, they were only prolonging what's, what's happening, that's all. And, um, and uh, what he did was, uh, I believe, was announced that they're going to do more studies on the fishery, which they've been doing for years and years. And I don't know what they're going to accomplish in a couple of months because I think he said uh, something like uh, the end of November. They were hoping to have uh, results. And as far as we're concerned, this is only just a bluff, that's all. You think they're just stalling? That's all, just stalling. Well, uh, all it appears to us, Bill, is that the, the government is deliberately trying to do away with the inshore fishery. There's nothing else for us to think only that. But because of all the delays and everything because else? Because of all the delays and uh, what's been happening over the last few years, I mean, they're not doing, you know, we, we thought they were going to, to reduce the quotas, I'd, you know, make some arrangements or do something so the draggers out there wouldn't be, wouldn't be dragging the Funk Island Bank like they've been doing the past few years, and apparently they're not doing that, and we don't know what's going on. Pretty disappointing, isn't it? It is. It is really disappointing. And uh, this past few years, there's been people getting out of the fishery. they got no other choice. And I would say after the year, there's going to be a lot more out of it. There's, there's, there's nothing. I mean, there's no fish in shore, and apparently the government is not doing anything to to up get, bring the fish in shore. Uh, but if they can't stay in the fishery, what are they going to do? What's going to happen to uh, all these communities? I don't know. I don't know. It's, uh, it's, it's terrible. Even the ravenous gulls underscore the extent of this year's failure. The gulls are always hungry, of course. It's nearly impossible to fill them up. But these days, they're hungrier, more savage than usual. How savage? Well, try tossing a few scraps on a wharf, and you'll soon find out. <laughs> 